Good day, uh, Mount Moriah and guests. Welcome to the sanctuary of Mount Moriah Baptist Church for our Bible study. Thank you for joining us on this day in, in the month, and we are blessed by your presence on today. We are continuing our conversation through the book of Proverbs, specifically today, Proverbs chapter 26 and uh, we're going to begin at verse 13 and uh, try to get to the end of the chapter, which is verse 28. If not, uh, then we will just pick up on the rest of it on next week. <clears throat> Keeping in mind that we are in what we call uh, the second collection of sayings uh, from King Solomon specifically, it is thought by some that these are proverbs that were written by King Hezekiah, who was uh, the king of Judah. Uh, chapter 25, verse 1 and 2, chapter 26 and chapter 27. These might be the sayings of King Hezekiah. Uh, there is no real historical evidence to prove that that is the case. Uh, but we do know that we are in this uh, second section of sayings um, that are ultimately attributed to King Solomon, chapter 25, verse 1, all the way down to chapter 29, verse 7. When we think about uh, Proverbs, specifically in chapter 26, there is this interaction with fools. Remember there are two people in the world, those who are wise and those who are foolish. Those who are, are wise are blessed. They live, they give an eternal life. Those who are foolish uh, will face ruin. They will die and live in eternal damnation. Well, what happens in chapter 26, there is this interaction with fools in these Proverbs. And the, and the goal is to teach us about how to properly read other people, how to properly read situations, and even how to properly read ourselves. And so wisdom teaches us um, to listen to people and say things, something's not right with that, or to look at a certain situation and wisdom says, you need to do this. Or even wisdom tells us, look, you need not to go down that particular road. You've had it that way, but you need not to go down that road. So we have in chapter 26 this whole interaction in which we learn how to properly read other people, ourselves, and even situations. Keep it in mind that these Proverbs are fitting for every aspect of life. It is fitting for relationships and it is fitting for our responses, our actions in every arena of life. So let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 26, beginning at verse 13, concluding to verse 28. It reads, a slugger says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As a door turns on his hinges, so a sluggard turns on his head. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. A sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel not their own. Like a manic shooting, flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their neighbor and says, I was only joking. Without wood, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. As charcoal to ambers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the innermost parts. Like a coating of silver dross 
on earth and where are fervent lips with an evil heart. Enemies disguise themselves with their lips, but in their hearts they harbor deceit. Though their speech is charming, do not believe them, for seven admonitions fill their hearts. Their malice may be concealed by deception, but their wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. If someone rolls a stone, it will roll back on them. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to come to study on today. We ask and pray that you would be in our midst and that you will be the ultimate teacher. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. As we look at verses 13 through 16 of Proverbs chapter 26, we have once again a section or a series of, of verses that talk about the slagger or the lazy person, the person who does not want to get up and go to work. In previous uh, verses, what we have had is this whole notion of Proverbs basically saying that a person who does not work does not eat. And a person who does not eat basically uh, starves to death, starves to death. So remember that we were in this agricultural era in which uh, persons had to plant till before that, till, plant, and harvest. And if you stayed in bed, too long, then you would miss the best part of the work day and therefore your crops would not be what you want them to be basically in harvest time. So we have another short collection of sayings on the slaggit. Uh, the slaggit is this slub class of a fool. So this is related to, to verses 1 and 12, uh, these verses that we have in 13 uh, through 16. And so we have this notion of the sluggard. And let me just, let me just read these verses 13 through 16. A sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As a door turns on his hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. A sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. So again, we have these sentences on a sluggard that can exist independently uh, but they basically come together as a unit. For example, in verse 13, we see basically a sluggard cannot leave his house or does not leave his house. There's a lion in the road, a fierce lion, lion in the streets. The sluggard does not leave home. The sluggard does not go to work. In verse 14, we see where the sluggard cannot get out of bed. As a door turns on his hinges, so, so the sluggard turns on his bed. So the sluggard does not open the door of his house to leave because if he opens his door, then the hinges are turned and all the sluggard does is turn around in his bed. Lazy, does not get out of bed, does not leave the house. And so all of this tossing and turning in bed uh, has made him, quote unquote, too weary to eat. And put in verses 13 and 14 together, he turns the door on the hinges, but he will not open the door for the lion might be walking the street. So it's, it's sort of crazy, but it, it does tell us uh, what a slugger looks like. And then this continues. Uh, the slugger thinks that he or she is so much 
wiser than everybody else. Verse 16, a sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. So we see uh, this sluggard who thinks of himself as wiser and has more common sense than uh, seven people who have common sense or have a common sense account of things. And laziness can prevent talent, position, wealth, and power. And these sluggards, they, they stand in need of wisdom. For they do not obey reality. They reject reality. And basically, what a sluggard is, a sluggard is a fool. So much so, again, this whole analogy uh, of the sluggard tossing and turning so much at night that he or she is weary, so weary that they do not eat. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but is too weary, too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. So we have to uh, be careful not to find ourselves in a position where laziness takes place. In verses 17 through 28, which is the rest of the chapter, is basically divided into four groups, three verses each. We have a section that concerns conflicts between neighbors and behaviors and characteristics that underline or create conflict. We have this inner and outward person that is dealing with deceit and how this deceit can be inward hidden and it can be displayed outward or seen. And so special attention is given to this. So let's dig into this verses 17 through 19. Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel, not their own. Like a maniatic shooting, flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their neighbor and says, I was only joking. Verses 17 through 29. It begins, these verses do, with this vivid common sense reminder of what happens when one gets into a fight uh, that they have no business being in. What happens is that one basically gets bitten. And what it warns us against is spending so much time and energy in someone else's business that we neglect our own. And we also have this comparison between a lying speech to deadly weapons. There was this claim that a damaging lie was only a joke that adds insult to injury. So, you know, a person who deceives their neighbor and, and says, I was only lying, uh, that's just like um, shooting flames of arrows that can cause death. So words are very, very powerful and you can just not use words and come back and say, I was only joking. And, uh, and again, it is that whole analogy uh, that I learned as a little boy. You point one finger uh, at someone else and at least three are pointing back at you. So that tells us uh, that 
We need to stay out of other people's business and pay attention to our own. We need not to rush into a conflict or a quarrel that has nothing to do with us. I think that that is, that is great advice. Verses 20 through 22 uh, continues this whole notion of the power of words to create conflict. Verses 20 through 22 uh, says, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. It ch as charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the innermost parts. So what happens when there is no wood for the fire? It goes out. Take a gossip out of a quarrel, the quarrel dies down. Wood is needed for a fire, right? And charcoal is needed to create an amber. And a quarreling person is needed to kindle a fire. But if you take the person out of the quarrel, the gossip, or the quarreling person out of the quarrel, then it would die down and strife will end. And again, it also talks about the power of words. The power of words for a gossip are so strong that they go down to the innermost parts. In other words, the words of a gossiper can affect a person tremendously. And that's why we have to be very careful what we say. So this inward malice is a source of deception that can affect others. Even a whisper of gossip can do plenty of damage. Anytime we wrongfully violate or attempt to damage the rights, the reputation, or authority of someone else in order to achieve our own end, we have committed a sin. So just think about a falsehood, a lie, a slander, a gossip, a distortion. What it is, it is that it is not reality. Falsehood, slander, gossip is a distortion of reality. And what it does is that it creates this interpersonal inferno. If I say a falsehood against you, if I slander against you, if I gossip against you, it is a distortion of reality. But what it does is that it creates a fire, an inferno between you and I. And uh, that is not what God desires. These next three verses, verses 23 through 25, they focus on the hidden, the inward dimension of a conflict. We see contrast between the hidden, the inner person, the visible, the outer person. And we know from the biblical tradition that is what is on the inside cannot be hidden. It will come out. And what we do on the outside is indicative of of what's on the inside, specifically the heart. So we have this contrast of lips, speech, heart, what's in the heart. We have this contrast, but again, what's in the heart will come out through our actions. And what comes out 
through our actions is an indication of what's in the heart. So let me read verses 23 through 25. Like a coating of silver dross on earthenware, our fervent lips with an evil heart, evil heart. Enemies disguise themselves with their lips, but in their hearts they harbor deceit. Though their speech is charming, do not believe them, for seven admonitions fill their hearts. This glaze, this silver uh, dross on uh, a pot is a shiny surface on the pot um, that is really not needed. It is um, what is called um, the shiny surface of the pot that is itself corrupt. And so what the proverb uh, is saying is that basically uh, lips uh, that gossip Lips that speak evil are indication of an evil heart. An evil heart speaks malice. And that's what this fervent, it talks about this whole notion of fervent lips. And what that simply means, again, is... Malice, literally burning lips, which basically lets us know that there is a corrupt heart. And sometimes people try to disguise what's on the inside, but it will basically come out through what is said. And sometimes we know that our enemies also use the power of speech to disguise or to hide what their true intentions are, what their true character is. But wise people can see through all of that. Wise people can see when uh, this corruption takes place, when uh, the heart is corrupt, when the words are not right. So if you're wise, you can see the facade of hypocrisy. You don't, do not trust persons who speak malice of others. And if you're wise, you do not take liars at face value. Their speech might be charming, but you do not believe them because... Their speech says that there is deceit harboring in their hearts. Verses 26 through 28 as we uh, conclude today. Uh, verses 26 through 28 expose inward hatred. And this inward hatred is the source of hurtful behavior. Verses 26 through 28, their malice may be concealed by deception, but their wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. If someone rolls a stone, it will roll back on them. A lying tongue hates those it hurts and a flattering mouth works ruin. So it talks about or affirms the actual consequence of just rewards. Verse 26, there are some who try to conceal their malice, by deception, by deceit. Uh, but God is a God who, who is just, and God is a God of exposure, so God is going to make that known 
to the people. He's going to expose that to the people. And then verse 27 basically says, uh, what goes around comes around. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. So if you do evil, evil is going to come back on you. But even before that, it talks about this whole notion of digging a pit. If you dig a pit for someone else, God's justice will be served. God's mercy will be served. You will fall into the same pit you dug. If someone rolls a stone, it will roll back on them. Rolling stones suggest that things were set in motion. Things were assuming a life of their own. It was beyond our control. And what it ends up doing is that those things that we have set in motion um, that are not good, it will in fact turn on us. What goes around comes around. You can call it karma. You can call it God's vengeance. But the thing about it is, is that God's justice is always at work. What you use to hurt somebody else is what will in return crush you. And I read verse 20, 28 again, and basically um, a lying tongue hates those it hurts and a flattering mouth works ruin. Uh, basically what it says is uh, a slick mouth works its own ruin. A flattering or a slick or a smooth mouth uh, connotates falsity, non-truths, and basically what it says is that that person will come to ruin. So that, that concludes uh, Proverbs chapter 20, 26. Now let's see. what the New Testament says uh, about all of this. Let's look at James chapter 3. And you can read verses 1 through 12. Let me just, let me just read uh, a portion of it. Verse 5, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boats. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly portion. Verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. So we have to be careful what comes out of our mouths because words are powerful and words can affect a person's life. Either positively or negatively, it all depends upon what is said. That ends our study on today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study on today. And we ask and pray 
uh, that you help us to live active lives, lives in which we speak godly things. In the name of the